the best way to get the ball in the hole is to get it closest. And so what Colin brings, which he is uh, superior at, is approach shots. So now even if he's behind Bryson by 20, 30 yards, sometimes longer, I get that, he makes up for it now with the approach shots. And now they're at least at even, or Colin sometimes has a an advantage over even a Bryson DeChambeau. So if I have a 15 foot putt compared to your 22 foot putt, I have an advantage now. So I still believe it's about control and decision making and uh, learning how to play out of different variables and stuff, not just how far can I hit my driver. Golf Smarter number 806 is brought to you by relieffactor.com slash golf smarter. Two-time major winner Colin Morikawa's lifelong coach, Rick Sessenhouse, on growing a champion golfer. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Rick. Hello, Fred. Great to talk to you. To be on. It's, Thanks for having me. It, well, it's it's actually an honor to talk to you because um, you've had a phenomenal year. Let's just start out by saying you are Colin Morikawa's coach. Yes. So it's been one heck of a ride. It's been an amazing year for you too. Um, I uh, you may not be able to tell, but I'm wearing my Harding Park PGA Championship. Uh, vest because Harding Park is my favorite course in San Francisco and it's only 25 minutes from my house. Well, it's 25 miles. It takes 45 minutes to get there once you go through (laughs) San Francisco. But it's so interesting. Since Colin won at that championship, I've asked a number of teachers, what do you think the future of the game is? Colin Morikawa or Bryson DeChambeau? Right? Because their games are very different. Mm -hmm. And obviously you have a bias, but I'd love to ask you that same question to start. Wonder, and it's a wonderful question because I think it shows us as golfers, there's many, many ways to be successful at this game. It's not just, you know, necessarily the best athlete, like in other sports, the biggest, strongest, fastest always, you know, is better. I think golf has these nuances that there's so many different skill sets that are brought to the table to get the darn golf ball in the hole with fewest amount of strokes as possible. Um, I'm not going to, you know, of course I'm biased because I know Colin so well, but from a skill set standpoint, let's think about it is the best way to get the ball closest, excuse me, to get the ball in the hole is to get it closest. And so what Colin brings, which he is uh, superior at is approach shots. So now even if he's behind Bryson by 20, 30 yards, sometimes longer, I get that. He makes up for it now with the approach shots. And now they're at least at even, or Colin sometimes has a an advantage over even a Bryson DeChambeau. So if I have a 15 foot putt compared to your 22 foot putt, I have an advantage now. So I still believe it's about control and decision making and uh, learning how to play out of different variables and stuff, not just how far can I hit my driver. Um, and again, it's a great skill to have. Uh, Colin will probably, as we keep moving forward, wanting to get more club head speed. Of course, that's a great skill. But I think what's being lost now is that there are tons of ways to get the ball in the hole. And so I believe Colin is superior with ball striking and decision making. And that's why he's uh, uh, above most of them. And that's why he's won two majors. And what, this is his second year on the tour? Correct. Yes. Unbelievable. How long have you been working with Colin? Since he's eight years old, so 16 years, as we're talking right now, is uh, he was an eight-year-old uh, coming up to me with him and his dad at a little golf course up here in Glendale, California, and came on up. He had already taken some group classes, and his dad said, hey, would you, would you work with him? I had already been working with a lot of top juniors at that time, and I saw him make a golf swing. I said, you bet. You know, he had already a very natural, natural swing to him. Right. And, and what I loved about him was just the coachability and his attitude and his listening. And, you know, I tell people eight, nine, 10 year olds back then, I wouldn't do more than a half hour because their attention span, but he did hour long because of just his engagement and his questions and just how he took in information. So it was a thrill to be able to work with him uh, through all his ages and top junior golf, college golf, amateur golf, of course, now, professional golf. It's just been a thrill. How long had you been teaching before you met up with Colin the first time? 
Well, I've been teaching golf for over 27 years. I'm a member of the PGA, so I've been with them 16 years. So we can we can do our math that I've already been coaching like 11 for years. 11 years or so and worked with a lot of uh, junior and college players at that time. So then when he walked out and, and first you were first introduced to him, did you know immediately, like, this kid is special? I think when you first see the swing, you go, okay, he's he's got a good talent base. He's got good hand-eye coordination, good balance, all that got great stuff. Um, I've told a story where when he was 12 years old that I came back home and I was sitting with my wife on the couch saying, sweetie, this kid's got it. Now he's 12 years old and people go, oh, what, you know, what, maybe the follow-up question is what is the what it? Is it? Yeah. Um, and again, it gets back to kind of how I answered before, extremely coachable, never made excuses, highly competitive, very curious, uh, wanted to learn. Uh, he looked at, I call it a growth, now it's called a growth mindset, but back then it's just about learn, learn, learn. He wasn't into failures and, and beating himself up. He comes from a wonderful family. The, the family was supportive. I'm going, wow, there's some good, unique ingredients here uh, that if he just continues to want to love the game and want to get better, he already has that competitive side and the learning and a work ethic. And not all juniors do. They say they do, but they don't always have that. I remember years ago, I was doing interviews with Major League Baseball players, and there was a guy named Carney Lansford. Sure. Who played on, Carney played on the Boston Red Sox. He's one of those guys with the perfect Boston name, but he was from Northern California. Carney Lansford, right? It's like No Magasia Para, <laughs> right? Perfect Boston name. But anyway, he played for Boston, then he came and played for the Oakland A's, playing up here it's when I got to interview him. And he was the first major leaguer that played in both the Little League World Series and in the Major League World Series. And I asked him, when you were playing in Little League, do you remember, were you the best, just far and away the best player on the team? And he said, no, I was the hardest worker. Yes, and, and I think that's the thing is you see a lot of talented juniors because at that time, a majority, 80% of my instruction was with competitive juniors. And so you see talent, you go, oh, a guy can hit the ball a long ways. Okay. But when you now look at different skill sets and you look at the coachability of giving that student, hey, here's what I want you to train and practice. So then next time I see you, you can work on it. And if they come back and say, ah, I didn't really have time to do the, the practice, you're going, oh, okay, there's a disconnect there, right? And so it's not always like Colin necessarily is not somebody who's out there 12 hours, but he is very efficient with this practice and it's about his learning and, and such. So I'm, I'm with you is that I've seen these juniors, they either, they get to a certain ceiling and they don't break through it because at least uh, maybe adversity or maybe other distractions and such. Um, and then the physical talent only takes them so far. And that's why you see that not every college all-star translates into professional golf. Or college all-star in any sport translates. Correct. We've seen it in basketball, football, baseball. We've seen them all across the board of the professional sports. You know, Definitely. you don't see it in gymnastics. Um, one of the things that, that really uh, motivated me to reach out to you was Colin talked about how playing golf versus hitting the golf ball that what he, what you've taught him as his mental coach as well as his swing coach but just playing each shot Let, yes. let's dig into that for a, a few minutes if we can i because i just love that concept sure so if, if we look at basic motor learning right we're supposed to do the same thing over and over and over again to make it unconscious right i have a skill i can swing a golf club and I think what has been lost in instruction, and I'm blaming my industry right now a little bit, is we think the only way to get that skill is to be on a driving range and hit a seven iron a hundred times and then tomorrow do it another hundred times, another hundred times. So we now have a golf swing that's repeatable. Of course, motor learning, there's some part of that. Yet golf is not played in a fixed environment like that. So you get people who had beautiful golf swings. All their positions were good. All their track band numbers are good. And then you throw them out in the middle of the golf course where the ball's below their feet in a slight divot with a back right hole location with wind coming in from the, and they're lost. They don't know how to hit golf shots. So Colin and I, and this is not just with Colin, but um, most of my lessons are on the golf course. 
So 70% of my golf lessons with Colin from the age of eight to 18 was on the golf course. Him and his dad hop in a cart with me, throw balls in different spots. We would do different exercises. I wanted him to learn how to play the game. One of my favorite exercises is to drop a ball down and let's say it's in the right-hand rough with an upslope lie 150 yards away. And I would say, Colin, how do you want to hit the shot? Now, I didn't tell him how to hit the shot. That's where instruction, I think, it's right. Oh, you're supposed to do this, this, and this. I want him to learn on his own. So he would hit a shot, and then I always get gave him a second shot. Now that you've hit the shot, what would you do differently? Well, Rick, that upslope lie made it go high left this time. I'm going to aim more to the right. I go, great, good. And then he would have to... I call it a feedback loop, learn, adjust, hit the second shot. Once the second shot was done, I'd say, hey, Colin, this is how I would look at the shot. This is how I would do the shot. I think because of that upslope lie, let's put the ball a little more back in stance. Let's, you are going to hit it higher. And, and I would give, and then you go, oh, okay. But I didn't just tell him that on the first shot. That's what most instruction is. You do this. Or the, because guess what? There's been sometimes Colin has taught me a better way to do something. I go, wow, I never thought about it that way. Or, and this is not just Colin, but others like, oh, I would do this. I go, oh, that actually makes sense. So I wanted him to learn with experiencing it and be able to go, oh, now I see the cause and effect. That lie made it go high left. Hmm, I need to figure this out. I would always be there on the ball three to say, from an instructional standpoint, this is what I would like you to do. So that for me was playing the game with the variables and I told him, I tell all my students now, I want you to make all your mistakes in practice. So then when you do get into that situation, you know, this is the lie is most likely going to do this because you've already experimented. And that's a word I use a lot, not fail. I've experimented. And what variable I change? Maybe I'll change ball position this time. Maybe I'll open the club face. I want somebody to be creative in their problem solving. Instead of, I'm just going to have my perfect positions on the, on the range uh, nowadays, I have a big pet peeve of just putting people's swings on Instagram and claiming that that is a good golfer. It has nothing to do with it. And then I look up these college players with their beautiful swings and they can't even make their travel team. So I'm not sure if that's what we should be coaching. So you can get me on a rant on that, but that's my basic answer on playing the game is about variables. Golf has more variables than any other sport I know. And that's the answers we're always looking for here on Golf Smarter. That was unbelievable. Thank you. Let's take a time out. We'll be back right after this. This episode of Golf Smarter is brought to you by Relief Factor. So I have a lot of energy. Actually, when my son was in elementary school, he once told the teacher that our last name, Green, G-R-E-E-N-E, -E -E, spelled backwards, is energy. And even, yeah, A E N E R G. Anyway, uh, even though I have a cup of coffee each morning, I only drink decaf. Go figure. But that doesn't mean that aging keeps me from my daily aches and pains that seem to just be part of life. And these can start to add up golfer's elbow, lower back pain, joint pain. Do you realize that pain is the number one cause of sleeplessness, trips to the doctor, and inactivity? Well, for the past couple months, I've been taking 100% drug-free relief factor, and it's made a big difference. I was skeptical at first, but my body is reminding me otherwise. The aches don't hurt as much, and the pain isn't getting in the way of my activities, especially golf. Have you ever noticed how the slightest pain in your back, arms, or your feet can impact your golf swing? The Relief Factor secret is its four key ingredients. Each one works on a different metabolic pathway to help your body heal the inflammation that exacerbates many everyday pains caused by aging, exercise, and everyday living. If you have everyday aches and pains too, remember, Relief Factor is 100% drug-free and designed to be taken every day so you can get out and stay out of pain. Check it out for yourself. Go to relieffactor.com, R-E-L-I-E-F-F-A-C-T-O-R, relieffactor.com slash golfsmarter and order their three-week quick start. Again, to claim your three-week quick start for only nineteen ninety-five, go to relieffactor.com slash golfsmarter. 
So with with your students, not just Colin, but there there's a technical element and there's a mental element. And then there's the emotional element. But it's all big picture. It's it's I, I like to talk about the X factor in golf that you don't find in other sports because a basketball court is a basketball court, no matter where you go. And a football field is a football field. Now, baseball has that, except you've got the fences could be different, right? So the outfield play, everything else is pretty much standardized. And you don't, none of that exists in golf between the amount of golf clubs you can choose, the, the, the weather conditions, and then the field of play. There's so many different elements to bring in. So you incorporate that with every one of your students. Definitely. Um, I, I grew up with other sports before I played golf. And so what sure. I always thought was interesting, I, I played in football. My dad was a football coach. And if I'm a quarterback, if I'm just throwing ball to my wide receiver, my arm looks good. Oh, this guy's got a good arm. Okay. And then we put him in, in running routes. And then we have people who are without pads. Um, we have a defense now. Oh, and then we have people rushing me. And then we have, uh, we add all these variables. And before you have time, I am not the same quarterback that was just tossing a ball here. I'm going for my life because of all of these situations of the actual game. I think golf is getting stuck too much into just, I'm just going to practice on a range and not be open to all the variables that come into play because sometimes these variables create distractions, they create doubts, they create interference, which now gets to the emotional side of a, of a distraction. Oh my gosh, I'm not sure what this ball is going to do out of this lie. And oh, there's water on the left. Oh, I didn't practice for that before. I don't want to go on the left. And now what we have is a change of focus that nobody was practicing on the range. They were practicing their better takeaway and make sure this position was good. I understand there's a time for that. But now I have to look at a variable. I have to deal with fear. I have to have a game plan based on my strengths. How are you going to know your strengths if you don't play enough, right? And so I want people to be involved with the game because I think golf is very situational specific. Well, the more situations you're in, the more likely that you've, you could fail at it, which is fine. But then you're going to learn from it. So the next time you're going to be better at it. So you... you create, you say, distractions and doubts. So the distractions is the physical, the, the doubts are the mental, and they all come into play. Well, sure. Right? A, a distraction could be many things. A distraction could be an internal thing like, oh, I have five swing thoughts right now. Or uh, it could be external. I see that, that water hazard on the left. Uh-oh, don't go there. That would be a distraction that could now trigger an emotional response. An emotional response could be a stress response, fight or flight. Uh, I'm going to steer it to the right, or I want to get this thing over with, right? Now the golf swing gets quicker, and they've lost the tempo. They've lost all the sequencing that they worked so hard on the range with, but now they're in a completely different state. So I talk about uh, mental, emotional, physical state is going to affect your tempo. It's going to affect your feel and your grip pressure, but people don't practice that. They, they practice on the range in a certain state where there's no consequences. And yes, they're, they're focusing, but they're focusing on technical side. They now go on to the golf course where now more variables are brought in. Some of the variables are relevant, right? Yardage, the hazard, all that kind of stuff. Hazard is relevant, but not to get locked in on that to where that becomes, of course, what I don't want. And then we have emotions. Are we confident? Are we anxious? Are we calm? I mean, those are the things that we can train, and yet people don't do that. I, you, you said something that's going to take me back to Colin for a minute. And as you're a parent and you're a teacher, so you get emotionally involved, I'm sure, with your, with your students. Definitely. What was it like for you at Harding Park? We'll start at Harding. <laughs> what was it like for you at Harding Park following along Colin on Sunday, knowing what had to happen and you can't do a thing about it, but there's your kid out there and he's your kid at that point. Yeah, it's, it was very surreal for many things. One is that, yes, I, I joke with people like when he won the open championship, I was not there with him, uh, travel restrictions and stuff like that. So I'm at home right, on, on my, I'm on my sofa with 
<laughs> his agent with my dad, my son, and we're watching him play and I'm a nervous wreck. But when I'm in person with Colin, I honestly am being honest. I'm not a nervous wreck. It's just, there's a weird thing of being on site with him. And that day there was a calmness about him all week, by the way, but that day to where there wasn't any anxiety of what's going to happen. It was like, I didn't say he was going to win. I'm not saying that, but I knew he's going to play well. And that was what I was excited about is I get to now and, and I get to watch a major championship final round. No gallery. Remember it was me, his agent, his girlfriend, and some media people watching. And I'm watching him uh, get tied for the lead, take the lead, hit his unbelievable shot on 16. I mean, I'm there with nobody in my way. Okay. And then he makes the pod and then, you know, giving him a hug and giving his caddy a hug. I mean, it is very surreal. And uh, it's one of the best uh, well, career moments of my entire life. And so, but I honestly was calm the entire time. There was just something about him. He was in a calm focus that I knew he'd play well. And then as you just cut, start seeing him going, going, he's, he's got everything just fine. Now we know there's luck. There's all kinds of other things. Who else is going to play well and stuff. But the things that were in his control, he was in control with. And it must have been difficult because I had forgotten at that moment. But of course, there was no fans. There were no fans out on the golf course. And because of the social distancing practices, and it was a very quiet place. I remember, I even mentioned this the other day. I remember when they were saying, all right, we're going to play on the tour, but there's not going to be any fans allowed. And I'm like, oh, good. Now they're going to start losing balls like the rest of us. Let's see what happens <laughs> when they can't find a ball because there's not 88,000 people standing there going, it's right here under my foot. Right. right? You're going to have to do that. But you obviously weren't practicing social distancing when you were watching because you had all these people with you. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, and at the end, I mean, there was volunteers and stuff like that, and the and the the executives of the PGA and stuff like that. So, you, so you had some people at the round, but when you're going hole one through fourteen ish, there's maybe six people in the gallery, you know, and and such, and so, uh, which again made it special. Of course, I wish he was in front of a full gallery like he was pretty much for the Open Championship, uh, but it was uh, again something I'm very, very, very grateful for to have that opportunity to be so close to be able to see all these great shots, to see how he handled himself. The, and, and the thrill of that um, is, again, something I'll never forget. I can only imagine how satisfying and gratifying that had to be for you. Definitely. Yeah. All right, let's take another time out and we'll be back. All right, now let's go to the Open Championship. Now, Colin... He's got a full gallery here, completely different energy, and it's the, you know, the major, right? The, the yeah. British Open, you want to know. It's the Open Championship. Right. And again, were you by his side? Were you, were you able to be there this time? I, I was not. So I had seen him. Oh, my him. gosh, you're kidding. Yeah, I was, <laughs> not, I was not there. So unfortunately... There was a lot of uh, COVID protocols and, and travel sure. restrictions and stuff like that. And I don't want to get too much into that. I mean, some coaches did make it no. over. Uh, but I, did, I saw him right before he left for the Scottish Open. And we spent some time together at, at his place in Las Vegas, uh, worked on a few things. Um, and you're prepping the best you can. Uh, he has a, one of the best caddies out there. And uh, so JJ was there within our prep and we're talking about potential things. JJ is, has... Uh, caddy for Ryan Moore for eight years. So he has been at an open championship. He has had some experience with that. So Colin, what again, one of his main um, skill sets is learning. And he goes full bore into how quickly he can learn something. So the Scottish hmm. Open occurs and he barely makes the cut. I think he was 71st, if I'm not mistaken. And most people would like, like, oh my gosh, he's not ready. And it's like, well, he's he's ready for the Open Championship because he learned so much at the Scottish about even turf conditions, about the how slow the greens were. And then Monday, he's working with TaylorMade, and they changed out his 7, 8, 9 iron to get better turf contact. He puts more weight into his putter. So he's he's not looking about, oh, my gosh, I just 
was 71st, it was like, huh, what did I learn from this week that's going to help me now in the Open Championship? And so we talked, you know, consistently throughout the week, talked about his practice rounds, and I could just see the buildup of once he saw the course twice, he had a very, he was very excited. Um, he liked Link's course. Uh, he has not done it before, but he likes the creativity. He likes the challenge. He likes, you know, him and in, in his caddy, JJ, creating a plan. All of that is right in his wheelhouse. So it didn't matter if he's ever played links before. To him, it was a cool experience to figure things out. And he's very intelligent. So I knew after talking to him that Tuesday of that week that he was ready to go. Um, and so, you know, day in and day out, he, you, you play solid first round and then very, very well the second round. And then you get into the, the weekend. And, and as everybody has seen it, he obviously last 31 holes, no bogeys. Um, he made some clutch putts. And, and, and he just played some awesome golf and yes, he played in, in, in front of all the, the crowd, but he likes that. See, that's the thing with having him play most of his golfs as a professional in the pandemic. Oh, how is he going to do? It's like, he's going to do maybe even better. He likes that energy. He likes that, you know, that, that juice that comes with that. And obviously he played extremely well in front of uh, those fans, which he loved and, and they're so educated and he just loves the history. And so it was just a fantastic thing. So I'm watching on the, on my couch in my, in my living room with his agent, my, and my dad and my, my son just cheering him on and, and jumping up and down and, and yelling. Oh my gosh. And a smart kid. Clearly he went to Berkeley. He went to Cal. Yes. We were going to call it Cal. Most people come around the country, call it Berkeley. So obviously he's a smart kid. That is not an easy school to get into. And I'm sure he didn't get in just because of his golf prowess. Not at all. He, and, and in fact, he, he did something that rarely has happened. He graduated uh, with, in the school of business, uh, uh, wow. school of Haas and uh, yeah, very, very difficult of to get through four years and four time all American at the same time. So um, he, he puts his mind to something he's going to get done. Amazing. When was it that he was first, was it being on the tours when he first started playing in front of large galleries? I mean, I'm sure that, you know, family, friends type of thing, yeah. going through college and junior golf and all that, but you don't have. Yeah, I think, you know, he, he was fortunate to play on the Walker Cup team where he went four and zero. Okay. And I'm not saying those are huge galleries, but you're playing for your country. There's, there's media, it's, you know, it's on Fox and stuff like that. And then you played a few US AMs. I think you played three or four US amateurs. So you're playing with that a little bit. Um, and he played as an amateur, he played in two PGA Tour events. Um, so I think there was times that you, you start to, to get used to a little bit of that. Um, when he first came on and he had his at, out of college in the first, well, I mean, really the first half, uh, six months was in front of gallery. I mean, he, he lost a, a Matthew Wolf, Matthew Wolf, Megan Eagle at three M. I mean, there's big galleries there. I mean, so, and, and so I, again, it's not that it was completely four and now going from no gallery to a gallery, his first eight events, he went through the first FedEx cup were with gallery. Um, so I don't think it was that big of a change that people think they just remember his, his win at the, at the workday charity where he beat uh, Justin Thomas or the, the PGA championship of no gallery thinking, Oh, he hasn't, done, he's done it before. He almost won three M for mm -hmm. crying out loud with mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people up there. Is he, um, he's, he presents himself very well on, on in media. Um, is he an outgoing person generally? Is he, you know, vibrant and around people? He's great. Or, you know, a lot of kids who are at eight years old, they're they're put in you know into a box of this is your specialty they can really get locked in that box and aren't comfortable around uh groups of people a lot of people uh how is he uh in person and how is he on the golf course when he's playing sure i, I mean i think he's comfortable being around people he's going to be able to be conversational I, I don't think you'd ever say he's going to be the life of the party and be highly personality plus but yeah. he carries himself, like you said, extremely well with media, extremely well when uh, I've seen him involved with corporate stuff or charity things. It's like he, he's, he's going to step up and he's going to be very engaging with people and he's very present and very commu good communication. Uh, again, I wouldn't put him as a, the, the hyper personality type person, 
Um, and then on the golf course, you know, he plays his best golf when he's fairly calm and maybe not a lot of talking, but he has no problem talking with his playing partners or his caddy. Uh, he's going to be very even keel when it comes emotionally. Um, and, and he's, he's done that through pretty much his whole life. I mean, as, as a junior golfer, he was one who was composed and he was calm. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean he didn't get mad. Uh, it was, uh, and he wanted to get better and he was very competitive, but he had a very good job of managing his emotions. Yeah. Does he have a killer instinct? I mean, when he's out there and oh, yeah. he knows he's in the hunt, does he's like, he just wants to stick his cleats right in the throat of his opponents and say, get out of my way? Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, uh, the other part, which I, I really glossed over about the instruction or my coaching with him and my juniors was the last five minutes was always competitive. So okay. I would say, hey, Colin, up and down, whoever gets up and down wins, right? And at an early age, he looked at that as a challenge that he wanted to take on. Not as, oh, this is unfair. You're a professional. This is... He never said that. <laughs> so he was always up for a challenge and he wanted to win. Um, and as we got older, it became more about trash talking and stuff like that. And he's very even keel <laughs> where he'll just kind of hit it close and kind of give me the look like, okay, I beat you again. Right. I mean, so it's these little, little slight daggers. He doesn't have to talk too much to get the, the, the... but he's looking at, being the best version of himself and wanting to be better today than he was yesterday. So I don't know if it's about, I'm going to stomp on somebody's throat type of, I think it's more of he wants to win because he wants to push himself to, to be better. So that's how I would look at his competitive side. Fascinating. Um, I know we've got a hard stop coming up in a little bit, so let's take one more time out and then I've got to ask you some stuff about my game. All right. <laughs> Good. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 122, one of the greatest voices in the game. And that actually covers the quality of his voice and the brilliance of his expertise. It's Tom Wishon. Tom's retired now, but in his prime, he was one of the most important club makers and designers the game has ever known. In this episode from February 2010, we talk about the rulings by the USGA that changed the way grooves and wedges were made. But we go a little further as we also discuss the idea of a different set of rules for the tour players and for amateurs, a.k.a. bifurcation. Most of the powers that be in golf have never really wanted bifurcation, and I count me as one of those. I like the fact that even if I go out and play a fun round, you know, under the rules, that I'm playing under the same rules that, you know, everybody else is out on the big tour, you know. For what you know, whatever you know, the traditional nature of the game appeals to that to say, let's not split the rules. Okay, well we've split them now, you know, because the irons and wedges that you and I will play for the next ten years are different than the ones that the tour players have had to start using beginning January one this year. Do they not you see know? the hypocrisy in that? Well, what they were supposedly doing in this was they were being benevolent dictators in terms of saying, look, Joe, regular golfer, we don't want to force you in tough economic times to go out and spend 600 bucks on a new set of irons and wedges just to have these new score lines. So we're going to allow all you regular golfers to go until 2020 at the least, playing your old stuff, and then we'll take a look at it again and determine when you have to make the change. That's part one of two with Tom Wishon. Club maker, author, and all around great guy. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans being released this Friday, episode 122. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are available from where you're listening to this podcast right now. Please subscribe and follow both so that you can get a brand new episode of either as it downloads to your favorite listening device. Rick, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Thank you so much for, for coming on. And um, I know that you have had a podcast. I'm not sure you're doing it anymore. No, it's been busy. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did one a few a years little ago. Bit. It's, been, it's been a busy couple of years. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoy sharing information have, and interviewing other people too, because I always want to learn too. Yeah. Well, it's... it's um, really entertaining and it's at your uh, easiest way to find is go to your website which is ricksessenhouse.com um and, and one of the things that i've 
done to my game recently and it's really had a major impact and I'm kind of surprised that it has, but then again, I'm not. A couple uh, episodes ago, we had a chance to talk to Bobby Jones' grandson. Wonderful. Yeah, Bobby Jones the fourth. And he's not only a golf historian with amazing stories, but he's a sports psychologist and a clinical psychologist. And one of the things that he mentioned was that he can, and I've heard this before, but it never really connected as it did with him, is that he can watch a golfer on television and know if the golfer's not going to succeed in that shot because of the amount of tension in his face and his jaw. And so I noticed that personally, when I swing a golf club and even when I putt, I'm biting down on my lips. You know, I'm sucking my lips in and I'm biting down hard. Right? And there's a lot of tension in my face. And then recently, I've been working really hard on keeping my left wrist, you know, instead of out, I'm trying to keep it in. And there's a lot of tension in my left arm, and which is developing some golfer's elbow here. Last couple rounds, before I take my shot, I drop my jaw open. And I let it hang. And I just try to remember to loosen that up. And now in the last one, I'm like, okay, let's just, yes, keep your hand there. Just doesn't have to be so tight. So I'm a lot looser. Right. And I'm succeeding. Right. I'm hitting the ball better. I'm making better contact, better ball flight, better scoring as a positive result of that. Can we talk about that? What do you notice about tension? You know, you even mentioned earlier calm versus tension. Sure. Um, you can see it in Colin and, and your players. Right. Yeah. I think if we look back at just the, 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 the general word state, right? So as a coach, I'm looking at mental, emotional, physical state of somebody. Now, okay. the physical state is maybe the effect, right? Like I feel tight. I feel relaxed. My, my body feels that most likely came from a thought beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. The thought of, oh, don't go in the water or, oh, hey, these people are watching me. Don't screw this up. Don't embarrass myself, right? That thought creates an emotional response. The emotion now gets the body to, again, a stress response, fight or flight, okay? So now we know that um, we have a fine motor skills that we're using in golf. And if I change now my muscle tension and even how fast I do it, we can't expect the skill to be the same. And so when we look at now backtracking and saying, well, what state do you want to play your best golf in? And some people go, oh, Rick, I've played my best golf when I've been relaxed, when I've been calm, and I go, great. Do you do anything in the pre-shot routine to help you get into that state? And most people say, no, okay? So we have breathing patterns, we have practice swings, we have even how we walk into the shot. Those would be how I'm using my physicality to regulate that. And then another thing, like I don't play as much golf as I used to, but people that play with me find it interesting that I play with bubble gum. So I love to chew bubble gum and blow bubbles while I'm playing golf. It's kind of me being a child. Okay. It's but part of Michael it, Jordan coming out, right? It's, there you go. <laughs> but part of that is, as you mentioned, with the tension of my jaw, I tended to be a very intense competitor and the teeth were clenching, but by chewing on the bubble gum, I'm reminding myself to keep this looser. I'm blowing bubbles. I'm, I'm keeping that part, right? Even like some people talk about focus and they have this hard focus. It's like, no, it's not hard focus. It's soft focus. So like even my eyes and, and how my, my whole face is, is going to affect my state that I'm in. So physically, if I'm relaxed and calm, most likely that means I'm focused and my thoughts are probably related to calm and focus. So they work, the mind body connection is, is, is super important. So yes, I can make assumptions to say, Hey, I've seen Colin be calm. He's going to hit a great shot. Maybe, maybe not. Or I might see him a little bit tight. Is he going to always hit a bad shot? No, I don't want it to be just this. It's only that cause and effect. Cause I think some people are very, very talented that they still hit quality shots, even when they're tight but they can't expect the same level of performance over the long haul if their state, literally their physical state is different. So yes, I, I'm, I'm big into facial stuff, um, breathing patterns, um, even like if I grip really tight and then let it go, you have now a relaxation response to that. Cause you literally, and then you can kind of like 
shake it out. But you have to have the awareness that you're tight in the first place. Most people, it's after the fact. They go, Rick, now that I think about it, I think I was really tight. I go, well, a little too late now. <laughs> having, the, having the awareness that I'm stepping into a shot with my jaw exploding and my grip pressure at a 10, that's the skill. Can you be aware of where you're at in that moment? And if you don't, if that's not going to be an optimal state for you, can you call a timeout on yourself like other sports and do something about it? It could be, okay, timeout. Ooh, let's take a breath. Let's refocus on what's in front of me. Let's do a practice swing at 50% speed. If we have that discipline, it all starts with awareness. You don't have to go into that shot right now. But most people don't have that self-awareness muscle built yet. That timeout, I usually like to call that a mental mulligan. Sure. Right? Where you could step away from it. Doesn't count on the scorecard. Totally. Right? But you could step away regroup yourself but most people and i think you would agree that most people don't even know that they have that tension Correct. what are some tips that you can provide us to help us catch it before it even starts or even recognize that you do that a lot i mean yeah. i recognize it because i saw a photograph of myself and my mouth was so tight <laughs> and my lips were like you know turning green it was it was just sure you know, what, sure I would say that there would be two key areas. One is grip pressure. Hands are the only connection with the grip, right? So in your range session, experiment with grip pressure. Uh, I'm going to hit these next three seven irons at a grip pressure on a scale of one to 10. I'm going to do it at a three. And I'll do these next three at five and these, these final three at, let's say, nine. Okay. And so now you have some self-awareness like, oh, well, nine really didn't work. Three is okay, but maybe five actually firm is okay. So I'm not saying that it has to be always relaxed, but then you have at least a baseline. Oh, I swing my best when I'm at a five on my, my grip pressure. That would be something that even in a pre-shot routine, as you put the hands on, you're being aware, okay, am I at a five, right? A simple question, but you had to have the baseline to work with first. Oh, I'm at a five, okay, feels good, right? The other one is you've already alluded to is with the facial tension. Um, I'm stealing this from some other really good coaches where if you put a, a potato chip in between the teeth um, and make, could make a golf swing without cracking down on it, now you probably have more self-awareness of what your jaw is doing, right? And so if you can have that in practice and put a, again, a potato chip would crack pretty quick, easily, you're going to be very aware of that. And can you make a golf swing? One, of course, without cracking it to begin with, but even in the swing, like, right? It's like, right. That one, I think it, it is a cool one to, to experiment with too. That's awesome. A potato chip. What yeah. Great, instead of a piece of dried mango or something, it's not going to help. <laughs> <laughs> but um, some dried fruit, because I eat dried fruit and I eat, I eat dried fruit and I eat peanut butter pretzels when, <laughs> when I'm playing, right? Uh, peanut butter pretzel would be, I would know if I crunched that or not. Um, who were your mentors? growing up and got you to the point that you decided you wanted to be a golf instructor, let alone a player. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I was very fortunate. I took up golf, well, nowadays it would be considered a little bit late for juniors. I was a 12 and a half year old playing other sports. But um, I was very fortunate that once I really got in the love of it, which was like 15, 16, my dad, who was not really a golfer at the time, said, hey, we need to get you lessons. We need to you know, get you going in the right direction. And my first mentor, his name was Tom Barber, and he was a head professional at Griffith Park Golf Course. His father was Jerry Barber, who won the 61 PGA Championship, was also a Ryder Cup captain, um, played on the Champions Tour, so on and so forth. And so I got lessons from Tom at that early age to get me going. I was fortunate to work at Griffith Park Golf Course um, when I was 16 up to 23. I got to be around a lot of good golfers, a great public facilities, 36 holes. So Tom was my first mentor of, of playing because I wanted to be a player, but also seeing the instructors that were there and seeing the business end of that. And then I think as I, I played college golf um, and wanted to play professionally, you know, I'm trying to get help from different spots. But I, I was obsessed with the tour, um, even though I at the time never met Freddie Couples or Nick Faldo. Those were my mentors in a way because I, I loved how Freddie went about his business. I loved the technical side of Nick Faldo. And so I was trying to blend into that, right? 
But I've been fortunate as I now became a coach to be able to network with other PGA pros, other mental game coaches, and you know, and then outside of that, I you know read a lot, and um, so it's more like like from books and seminars and stuff like that that I'm always trying to to be a sponge for information. Well, you can be very proud of the fact that now there are a lot of golfers out there from all ages that, and I'm going to use your air quotes that Colin is now a mentor to so many. Yes. And it's because of your influence. Thank you. No, and that means a lot to me is I certainly felt I helped cultivate something in Colin that was in him and he had great parents and, and like that. And now to be able to see how this younger generation is now looking up to at the time we're talking is this, he's a 24 year old professional golfer and Colin, that means a lot to him. He, he wants to, to help these juniors. He wants to be a good role model. Um, and so that I am proud on that end too, to see how he handles himself. And now I have these 12 and 13 year olds who want to hear Colin's stories, but they're doing it because yes, he's a great player, but they see how he handles himself. And that's where I'm most proud of. That's amazing. That's amazing. So what are the services and what are, what can people find about you and learn more and get in touch with you if they need to give us uh, how to find you and, and read about you and read your writings? What do we got? Appreciate, appreciate it. Thank you. Best oh, place is, is my website, uh, ricksessinghouse.com. And on there I have, you know, some, some podcasts, some videos, um, and service wise, you know, I, I have a busy schedule, uh, but uh, I do a lot of Zoom coach, a lot of Zoom coaching on the mental side of the game, uh, for, uh, and I do some instruction in person. Uh, I do travel a lot with Colin. Um, I do some corporate speaking on performance under pressure. I would be starting a new uh, a new website here shortly called uh, it'll be called Flow Code Golf Academy. That's not the URL, but uh, you'll find some of that stuff on my website soon. Is we want to bring uh, mental game coaching to the masses uh, with an online platform. I wrote a book called Golf the Ultimate Mind Game, which came out like 17, 18 years ago, working on a new book right now. So a lot of cool stuff. Uh, very, very fortunate to, to be able to do what I love. You travel. Yeah, I, I have to throw this in because you said you, you travel a lot with Colin. Yeah. Does he want you around anymore on majors? Because apparently he does really well when you're not there. <laughs> well, hey, I was there for the PGA. That was good all week. Well, um, you were, uh, yeah, but you were on the couch when he won it. No, no, no. PGA, <laughs> but PGA was there. The, oh, the oh, open, wait. open championship. I was not. Oh, in San Francisco, you were there. I was there. Yes, that I was, was. I missed. I was on the whole. No, I was segment. in the gallery. No, 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 no. I was okay, in the gallery okay. with his his agent and his girlfriend at the time, and and it was awesome. We had a what? So, oh. um, so, uh, yeah. He, Colin and I, have, you know, we kind of know what works. Um, kind of every other event I'll be at, all majors I'll be there all week. Uh, we work a lot at his home in, in, in Vegas. Um, but it's about, certainly you, you're you refining to get even a little bit better the next day. So uh, we're always looking to get better as, as great as his start of his career is. I know he wants to achieve more and uh, just so, so grateful to be part of that journey. And I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Thanks so much. This has been awesome. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate it. Okay, it's not, this is not a commercial break, but if I say Shirley Temple, what comes to mind? An adorably sweet childhood movie star in classic black and white musicals? A U.S. ambassador? Or a non-alcoholic mixed drink made with ginger ale, grenadine, and a maraschino cherry? My guess is that most people born after the 1960s would refer to the drink, right? And there are variations of the drink, like a Roy Rogers that includes cola instead of the ginger ale. I once heard a bartender call it a Pee Wee Herman, just to keep it relevant. Well, until Pee Wee fell out of the public's favor. And for golfers who don't drink but want something refreshing at the 19th hole, we have the Arnold Palmer. A mix of iced tea and lemonade, a classic. And there, of course, there's the John Daly, which adds vodka to the drink, or the Juan Daly, which substitutes the vodka for tequila. Of course, Arnie will never lose relevance as the greatest of his generation. But will people remember John Daly in the next decade and beyond? Mm, not sure. I bring it up because recently, while at the 19th hole, Hanging with my playing partners, I asked for a mixture of iced tea and grapefruit juice. 
The bartender was intrigued. That sounds interesting, he said. I've never heard of that combination before. What do you call that? As I had just made it up, I thought for a moment, and of course, I said, a golf smarter. <laughs> so he created a tall one for himself and was astonished at how much he liked it. So the next time you're inclined to order an Arnold Palmer, go with grapefruit juice instead and ask for a golf smarter. <laughs> now, I mentioned last week that I went paragliding over Malibu for my birthday. The video is completed and can now be seen on our YouTube channel, Golf Smarter TV. Remember, basically, I have difficulty with standing in high places, but I really enjoyed this. Even though my wife has reported that I did look pretty stressed out in the video, I didn't think I was having that much trouble. It's also on Instagram at Golf Smarter. Follow at Golf Smarter on social media and subscribe to Golf Smarter TV on YouTube to hear our podcast and watch different kinds of videos that may not be golf, but mostly they are. Golf Smarter is your podcast for Caddy. And like Caddies, we graciously accept tips for services provided. And I want to thank Joseph Moon, who gave a generous tip this week and said, Hey, Fred, thank you for the great podcast. I enjoy listening regularly. Great information and tips. I'm glad I found Dynamic Golfers through Golf Smarter. It has certainly improved my flexibility. Thanks, Joseph. The tip jar is now open. Just click on Donate at GolfSmarter.com.